Okay, um, thanks. I'm under strict instructions to stay within the purple boundary. Um, so I will try not to move too much, which might be a good thing anyway. Um, so first of all, thanks to Elaine and the others on the conference committee for all the work that's gone into this. Um, you know, getting back in person is difficult um, and it's good to have a hybrid element to it, but it's not easy um, and it's within constrained resources. So there's a little bit of feedback, isn't there? Um, so I just want to thank them for all the efforts because it's not, it's not straightforward at all. Um, before starting, myself and also the committee thought it was important to acknowledge some news that may, people may have heard today, which is the, the death of Carol Thomas, um, who has been hugely influential in both um, medical sociology and disability studies and exactly what I'm going to be talking about in, in the next uh, 45 minutes. Um, obviously the news just came out today, so it's still something that we're thinking through, but the, we will work through and the committee will work through ways to sort of properly acknowledge Carol and the work she's done, particularly given we're here in Lancaster where much of that, that work was undertaken. Um, a couple of other things I want to say before I start. Um, I am talking about chronic illness and disability, um, and I don't always think one's positionality needs to be acknowledged, but I think, given what I'm talking about, I probably should acknowledge that I am the partner of someone with severe ME, and that has influenced some of the ways in which I'm thinking about chronic illness and disability, so that's one aspect I just wanted to acknowledge. Um, the PowerPoints are a bit wordy because I'm still trying to work through some of this stuff, um, and also I've tried to make them as accessible as possible so there's not much in the way of imagery. If there is imagery, I'll describe it. Um, and there's nothing I'm saying that won't be on the PowerPoint. So apologies if it, all that makes it a little bit wordy. Um, so I best crack on. Um, so as a bit of an introduction, um, when, they first, when I was first asked by the committee to speak, um, it was February 2020, those innocent times. Um, before the pandemic and everything else that has followed. Um, and my, what I was going to do was the disability studies medical sociology debate, because I very much sit in, in both camps. Um, but everything that's happened since then, um, and some of the work I've been trying to think about, I've kind of shifted slightly that it's not about medical sociology and disability studies, but about disability impairment, chronic illness. And that, that lens shifting slightly, I think, is important because it also will bring in a range of other writers that I'm, I'm trying to think about. So what I'm trying to understand is the boundaries that we see or we try to conceptualise between chronic illness, disability and impairment and think about some potential alliances which are now possible from a series of, of disciplinary areas, activism and writing that is happening across all of those areas. Some of it framed as disability studies, or medical sociology, but not all. And that's why I've kind of not framed it as about the two disciplines. Um, and in particular, what I want to focus on is embodiment and the significance of the body to our social location, to dynamics of oppression, to various kind of social dynamics we see here at large in, across the globe just now, that the body needs to be part of our analysis of um, and our thinking about. Um, I will be using and talking about disability and chronic illness rather than folding chronic illness in to disability. And when I'm talking about disability here, I'm talking about the political category of disability. Um, but I'm, what I'm trying to think through is these aspects that have come through the debates on chronic illness around pain, around illness, around fatigue, that don't always get covered within that social category of disability. Um, and what I want to try to do is think through and pull together a range of approaches that I think are trying to identify what are the cultural and, sorry, cultural and structural systems which prevent those with impairments, those with illnesses living well. That's what I'm going to try and do in way too long a time. Um, so very quickly, just to go through the disability studies medical sociology debate. Um, I think probably most people here are familiar with it, so just a bit of a um, snap account of it, um, but a very useful resource to get more in depth into the work, and Carol Thomas has a really good chapter in it, is New Directions in Sociology of Chronic Illness, um, edited by Graham Sam Scambler and Sasha Sambler, who's here. Um, one other sort of um, simplification that I'm making is I am, or two simplifications, 
At this point, I'm talking primarily about the UK debates between medical sociology and disability studies, and I'm also primarily talking about the social model. This will expand as, as we go through. Um, so we know that there's been this tension in disability studies and medical sociology where the sort of tension is framed as disability studies looks at social structures which create disability. Medical sociology looks at illness and lived experiences of illness which can themselves be affected by inequality. Um, and it's those sort of tensions that I want to try and kind of peel apart and, and kind of put to the side in a sense. There is a shared agenda within disability studies and medical sociology about medicine itself, obviously, um, but the approaches tend to be different. Um, so quickly, the disability studies approach to medicine, you know, in its early formulations and the work that led to the social model, very much framed as an opposition to medicine, framing medicine as primarily a source of oppression. And within that account, to argue that medical sociology was a little bit too comfortable with the medics. They were too much aligned with medicine and the study of medicine. Um, so the disability movement uh, creates this distinction between disability and impairment. Disability is the social structures. Impairment are the mind-body differences that are then not, a, um, that the society doesn't adapt to, doesn't respond to creating then the disability. Um, and within that, because of that distinction, disability studies has not focused on individual health and sort of seen that as something that was um, falling into medicine, seeing as a tragedy, but also as something that excluded disability because they argued that what medical sociology does by focusing on ill health and health is it excludes those who are disabled but not ill. Um, they are off the counter, they're not considered in understandings of why medicine would do certain things to people who are disabled, um, but who are well. Um, so, as part of that critique, medical, sorry, disability studies also argued that concepts such as biographical disruption and stigma that had emerged within medical sociology were either kind of ignorant of um, social oppression and inequality, or complicit in the processes that generate inequality and oppression. There is medical sociology obviously responds to that and argues, yes, of course we're interested in inequality. Yes, we understand oppression exists and we do want to study it. Critical realism was produced as one possibility of a way to kind of try to kind of get to both kind of understandings of lived experience, but connecting that lived experience to then social structures, to systemic dynamics of inequality. But nevertheless, the tensions have remained. Um, and Carl Thomas, in her work in the edited collection and elsewhere, has advocated for a sociology of disability because she doesn't feel or argued that medical sociology couldn't really engage with the political aspects of disability that disability studies did. So part of the critique then of the social model that developed from this point and Carl Thomas was part of, was saying we need to bring the body back in. That if we're only looking at structures and these external factors, we're ignoring the experiences of living with impairment, living with illness. Um, and that so many aspects of living with ill health and illness and impairment were put to the side um, because it was seen as politically inconvenient that we needed to focus instead on these structures, on these systemic issues. Um, and what, that what creating and what sustaining this impairment disability dichotomy requires is a silence about particular issues. So what um, people have tried to argue is that if we're starting to look at chronic illness and we're starting to look at things such as pain and fatigue and other aspects of living with illness, then we have to go beyond the social model. The social model advocated that all those things could be incorporated into the social model by focusing on social structures and acknowledging, of course, that people need to have access to medicine and treatment, but that for the social model, the political priority was elsewhere, was on these broader social structures. But what that has meant is that for some um, who do experience chronic illness, they have felt that the social model hasn't always been a framework that could work with the issues that they're trying to deal with. 
That critique has also been made by people um, who do define themselves as disabled as well. Um, so just some examples of some of the areas of, of illness that have led to people kind of questioning how effective the social model is for thinking also about illness and ill health. Um, so A, people have argued that people with degenerative conditions, um, that their experiences are not really kind of engaged with within the social model, in particular their drive to have medical um, treatment and to see medical research develop to, to create cures for their condition. Um, also people with ME and other um, conditions, illnesses, experiences that don't have this kind of clear diagnostic category spend much of their time politically advocating for medical categories, while the social model tends to kind of wish to see the end of medical categories. Um, one example where this came to the fore, it was a few years ago now, was Christopher Reeve, um, who, while he was alive after his accident where he was um, paralyzed, he was a major fundraiser, fundraiser for medical research on spinal injuries. Um, and when he died, this led to a bit of debate again between those who saw him as a hero because of the work he was doing trying to fund medical research and others within the disability movement who saw him as someone who was problematic because he couldn't or wouldn't articulate a positive life with someone with the level of paralysis that he did. We also see these tensions around the debates around euthanasia uh, and assisted death, where generally speaking, those who are in favor of legalization tend to be those experiencing um, significant chronic illness, degenerative conditions, and those advocating against legalization are coming from the disability movement, arguing that this is a threat to disabled people's lives to legalize assisted death. This also came through in debates around do not resuscitate orders, particularly during the pandemic, where disabled people were very rightly concerned about do not resuscitate orders being imposed on them if they ended up in ICU. And some with chronic illnesses worried that their advanced directives not to have resuscitation or ventilation would be ignored by medics if they ended up in um, ICU. Final example is The Real Deal, which was a program which was on BBC about a year ago. And this was a series of short films um, written, directed, and acted in by disabled people. It was part of the 25th anniversary of the Disability Discrim Discrimination Act. It's a great set of, of films. In one episode called The Real Deal, um, Liz Carr uh, played a disabled person watching their neighbor. Um, and their neighbor wasn't visibly disabled. Um, but had a series of chronic illnesses and had successfully been able to apply for personal independent payment, while the Liz Carr, Liz Carr character had not been able to get the level of payment that she had applied for. She then dobbed the neighbor in, um, and that was the end of the program. And this led to, again, a kind of flurry of debate about whether the disability writers who had created the program had fallen into that trope of so seeing particular disabilities as being the right kind of disabilities that should get welfare benefits like PIP and other forms of, of illness is, is not the same. Um, now the writers claimed and argued um, very strongly that what they were focused on is the problems around PIP, not trying to create this false distinction between the right disabled people and the wrong chronically ill people. But it was interesting to see the debates that, that emerged around the programme for exactly raising those sorts of issues. Um, so since then, since the social model, there have been various critiques of it and people have tried to rework it and rethink it. And it's important to stress that much of that work has been within disability studies. It's not just external to them. Um, and much of this work calls for a return to the body, to a way of thinking about how the body is a source of social dynamic that places in particular social locations and causes various social problems, as well as being a source of identity and positivity within that. Um, and what this work is trying to do is find ways of talking about ill health, talking about pain, talking about fatigue in ways that are not tragic, are not individual, are things that are engaged with the social. Um, Hughes and Patterson's paperback from 1997 remains a really important starting point in this work, um, advocating that the social model had disappeared the body um, and that disability studies should be looking at, at concepts and ideas within medical sociology, such as 
um, phenomenology. Amazing that I said that correctly. Um, you know, as ways to think about medicine, to think about ill health within our studies, within sort of academia. Shakespeare and Watson, who are very much within disability studies, but critique the social model quite strongly, argue that we shouldn't see impairment and disability as these dichotomous categories. They're a continuum, they argue, and that they, quote, describe different places on a continuum or different aspects of a single experience. And so they frame a social model very much as an ideology, a useful, a very useful ideology. But in terms of conceptually understanding disability and chronic illness, we need to expand from that framework. A uh, so recent intervention in trying to do this work is the Chronic Illness Inclusion Project run, um, led by Catherine Hale. Um, and in that work, they're trying to examine what the social model can and cannot say about chronic illness. Um, so they acknowledge that there are some very important uses for the social model for those living with chronic illness. They argue it helps us understand that our feelings of undeservingness, of shame, of feeling like a fraud, come not from our own flaws or weaknesses, but from deeply negative social attitudes around disability. But they argue that there's a need also to engage with these experiences of pain, of distress, of worry about death, of the limited capacities that people with a range of chronic illnesses experience. So they argue that for those with, and they talk very much, it has a strong focus on, on ME. Um, they talk about energy limiting chronic illnesses as a particular lived experience that is significant. Um, and they argue for people in that context, that you know, the environment is an issue, but part of what is their biggest issue is people not acknowledging their impairment, their illness. Um, so they argue that if once you start bringing in chronic illnesses into this, particularly those poorly understood or recognized, then it shifts the importance of what the social model should be looking at. So they argue that disbelief and invalidation form disabling barriers to living as fully as possible with chronic illness. We suggest that developing a social model of chronic illness means understanding the suppression as a form of ableism. This is challenging and involves turning ac ac accepted ideas about ableism inside out. For example, in relation to disability discrimination, people with chronic illness experience hostile treatment on the basis of a denial of their disability rather than directly because of it. Now, the next intervention I want to highlight, again, is very prominent, um, is critical disability studies, which has sort of pushed disability studies in quite a different route than that within the social model. So they do quite bicker, quite a lot. Um, so Sheldrake, who is one of the, the key writers around critical disability studies, she argues that you know, part of what we need to engage with is the way in which modernity has created a set of cultural values which create this distinction between the normal body and the abnormal body. And that these cultural constructions are really important for understanding the disvaluing of particular bodies who fall within the category of the other or the non-normate in, in her language. Um, so all forms of embodiment that seem to not fit with this category of normality or the normate are then seen as disposable, as the misfit, um, as really a category of other person which is favored less than the category of the normal. And what Sheldrick argues is that this is a very sort of you know, sophisticated cultural discursive construction which is there to create an imaginary that you can divide people into these two separate groups. But instead, she argues, all bodies fail. We all experience impairment. We all die. Um, and that this, this fixation with creating these different categories of people is a barrier to us recognizing that human truth and also a barrier to us recognizing that there are lives worth celebrating and living in positive human possibilities within those placed in that category of the other or the non-normate. Um, so I want to move on to some newer writings in terms of, well, newer in terms of I'm reading them now. Um, and it's been very good to start reading again. Strongly recommend it. Um, so I've been sort of far too late in the course, as is often the case, you know, engaging with work that comes very much from different margins, um, different boundaries, including margins within the academy, and, and including from work that is based on, very rooted in activist work, and trying to think about what it is like to live 
in those contexts where you are facing the most extreme forms of inequality, where you're ex experiencing significant exploitation, contexts of wealth or austerity, dealing with multiple forms of oppression. So clearly this work is, is, is looking at the UK, but is looking beyond, is looking across the global north and global south to think about these dynamics and to understand the intersectional forms of inequality that are happening in different locations and which are embodied um, and how we need to theorize and activize around this. So some of this work is coming from the global south, is coming from writers who are marginalized within academia and are important voices to begin to think about. Um, so Mika Shah, um, who argues, is one of the writers which I think is making some interesting interventions here, argues that disability studies, because it emerges in the global north, needs to acknowledge that at least aspects of its practice are forms of scholarly colonialism, and medical sociology needs to do the same, um, particularly some of the histories of medical sociology. We cite each other. We don't go out of our comfort zone to look at other work and think about other writers and activists out there. We look at the global south to research rather than to think of them as a source of theoretical thinking. Um, and what some of this work is doing, I think very powerfully, is linking illness and, and disability to oppression um, and understanding kind of how multiple sources of oppression that some people experience are what are the creating points for chronic illness and disability. That there are some people more at risk of experiencing impairment, chronic illness or disability because of where they live um, and because of the world around them. Um, so Schlack and Kim argue that disability studies has not shown much interest in particular illnesses which in terms of understanding how they're here, how they're experienced and who has the toughest time having those illnesses, you need to understand questions of inequality. You need to understand questions of structure. So they talk about and highlight HIV and AIDS, asthma, diabetes as illnesses which you cannot understand without thinking about their social production and systems of inequality. And they point to a heritage of work by feminist of color disability studies as being work that is doing exactly that, that has long engaged in issues of the body, illness, health, and medicine and disability. Work that examines how bodies are shaped, reshaped, mend, and destroyed by heteropatriarchy, white supremacy, and capitalist violence. Um, so underpinning much of this work is an attempt to link, as critical realism tries to do, um, link the material with the discursive. That it's not just looking at the cultural representations and values about normality, but about the social production of concepts of normality and who can live in the normal and who can't, who is excluded from that category of the normal by very real material oppressive purposes. So Puar, in her work, challenges critical disability studies and its argument that we should think of a, a sort of continuum of human diversity, that we all fail, that we all die, because she wants to argue that doing so erases social conditions which some experience more than others, that will lead some bodies not just to be disvalued and seen as the non-normate, but also to be maimed, to be killed, um, to be impaired by actions of war, of famine, of environmental destruction, and other sources of systemic inequality. So that's a challenging question to kind of say, well, can we, is there a problem with celebrating human diversity? Is there a problem with saying we're all kind of in the cycle of life where eventually kind of our bodies fail and that we can celebrate and be positive about bodies that are different? Um, what she wants to argue is that if we see this as a, a long extended continuum, we miss these particular points which are really important for recognizing that we're not all vulnerable in the same way, that we do face different struggles, that we do face different risks of being ill, and that to be ill in particular locations is a far worse thing to be than to be ill in other locations. So she argues that there is much suffering so, sorry, argues that much suffering is neither random nor arbitrary. And drawing from the late Berlant, argues that we should be focusing on those who are experiencing a slow death. Um, and in a sense, what these people, people that Puar is focusing on are those that are facing the double penalty of neoliberalism. 
So while we can recognize that fatigue and pain um, and limited capacity lead to, we can argue, suffering and vulnerability that is personal, what is as important is recognizing the social production of that vulnerability and that um, suffering. And that we need to acknowledge that that social production of suffering and vulnerability is not equally felt. Um, the disability movement and particularly the social model has, always, has argued against the language of suffering and tragedy and vulnerability because they see it as something that falls within this individual narrative of the individual tragic figure. So what Poe and various others are arguing is that we do need to engage with the language of suffering and vulnerability, but place it in a political register rather than an individualistic register. Because there are bodies that experience this double penalty of neoliberalism in terms of their body is made ill by neoliberalism and then also neoliberalism judges them for this body that is ill. So this double penalty is faced by particular uh, communities and groups in different societies. So from that she asks, well, who are the viable neoliberal subjects? So it's thinking about suffering as a political term. Um, so Mika Shah um, rejects the ways in which disability studies has not used the language of suffering or vulnerability and argues instead for placing the language of suffering into an understanding of historical legacies of oppression um, and the ways in which those dynamics of oppression from the past and the present are creating particular kinds of bodies that don't fit in this disability slash chronic illness um, dichotomy. So she argues the Northern Disability Studies differentiation between chronic illness, impairment and disability cannot usefully explain the contemporary lived experiences of indigenous peoples. And people are beginning to use the language of suffering um, and vulnerability within disability studies. So this is just one example from Mladenov and Brennan, um, where they argue that suffering and vulnerability are a feature or outcome of social arrangement rather than as a characteristic of individual bodies or minds. So I want to try and bring these ideas together a little bit in a way that makes sense to me, but maybe not to others. Um, so I think it is important to when talking about impairment and chronic illness to think about the experiences of living as differentially embodied and that there can be suffering that comes from that experience. And because of that suffering, it is legitimate to seek medical treatment and research. But it is important to highlight that one of the issues around medical treatment, particularly when you put it in a global context, is the deeply unequal access people have to medical treatment and to medical research. And this is a particular theme um, within chronic illness and uh, conditions such as ME, and we're seeing it in the debates around long COVID now. Um, so it's sort of advocating that there's a way of trying to bring the sort of um, interests of disability and chronic illness together by highlighting some of the shared dynamics while recognizing within those shared dynamics that there will be things that are different. So it's about identifying the role of inequalities in the production of illness and disability and then the lack of fit between particular embodiments and the expectations of the good productive citizen. And one area where we see that, and I'm just going to move on to now because of time, is around social care. And again, social care is not a cheery area to look at. Um, so welfare austerity, just in case you were hoping things were going to go up a bit. Um, so welfare austerity, we know, has generated significant reductions in real terms in the ability, particularly of local government, where much social care is managed, um, to actually cover the social care needs of, of their communities. So I had a lot more statistics and I've got it down to this one. Um, so the National Audit Office, and, and this is about England, are highlighted that central government funding for local authorities in aggregate fell by 55% between 2019-20 compared to 2010-11, resulting in a 29% real terms reduction in local government spending power. And at the same time we see all these reductions, we also see that people are recognizing that, you know, as things go on, the need for social care is only going to increase. Now, much of the media debate is framed around aging, and there are reasons why aging is a prominent feature, but what is given much less attention in itself as a, an example of marginalization is discussion about disability and of chronic illness. Um, but social care isn't just about needs, 
no, no, it's about the market. Um, social care in the UK is very much a market, uh, very much a marketplace with the role of private companies within the um, production, the role of, of social care. So just one example here is a report which was produced recently by um, Lang Businessen of home care and social uh, supported living. Now, if you want to get the report, it does cost between £1,295 and £3,250. What it highlights is where there are markets, there are other markets. So you know, we need to think about the ways in which the social care is a market. But as a market, is actually a very fragile market. There's not that yet much money to be earned. So 55% of large for-profit care homes, <coughs> sorry, and 39% of large for-profit care at home providers reported a return on investment of less than 5% in 2019. Significant numbers are not financially resilient. Now, I'm not... Sorry, I'm not worried about the shareholders here. Uh, what I am worried about is if you're working in that sector, what that means is your pay and your working conditions are crap. Um, and that's what we're seeing across social care. But it, <laughs> Cam, um, it isn't just social care that has become a market. Welfare is also now a market. And we have ATOS and Capita are two of the biggest um, companies who are involved in the assessment of employment support allowance and personal independent plans. Um, and we've seen the controversies around the number of appeals, the number of deaths, you know, just grim stuff. But don't worry, as the Capital website says, we're here to support you. Um, so it's okay. Um, but it's not okay. The role of commercial actors in the operation of social and welfare is a problem. Because what it means is that corporations rather than the state control many of the domains domains where the new rights claims are being formulated. And the figure of the citizen is semantically morphing into that of the customer, the client, or the digital user. In some ways, they're an example of what Poar talks about as being that debility is profitable for capitalism. So it means that, at least in part, decisions about access to welfare and social care are made by private agencies who have an agenda that is not about providing good social care. Um, and it means that, as Fursad argues, that our citizenship is becoming transactional between these different actors. And entitlement depends on where you sit within those lovely scores of PIP and ESA. And so the, what this represents for Mitchell and Snyder is a micromanagement of increasingly informatic bodies. Um, I'll just jump because I'm conscious of time here. Um, so the problems that this creates is that, you know, A, families and informal sector are filling the gaps that the welfare state is no longer providing. And for Fraser, this is an example of the crisis of the latest version of capitalism. It is an expression of the social productive contradictions of financial capitalism, where people are required to work more to survive, but the support structures which would enable you to do that are no longer present. Fraser, as others does, focus on childcare and a bit of elder care, but again, doesn't talk enough about disability and chronic illness. Now, this is in strong contrast to what the disability movement advocated welfare should be. But within the disability movement, welfare should be about supported independent living. And they long advocated in the UK and in other contexts that this was what the role of the welfare state was. And this did lead to policy change. This led to, in the UK, personalization of welfare policies such as direct payments where people chose what support they needed rather than have that dictated by welfare agencies. But the problem is, is that in the context of welfare austerity, the capacity of welfare services to provide supported independent living is no longer there. And instead, it's been absorbed into a kind of very liberal commercial logic into how it operates. So we've outsourced social care to these private agencies. And this means these poor working conditions for those who work here. So this was just a bit of data that came out just a couple of weeks ago um, from the King's Fund that highlighted that the minimum rate of pay for staff over 23, as of June 22, it was £9.50 an hour, 30 pence less than the, sorry, within 30 pence of the living wage, um, and that 50% of staff were paid at that level. Well, in comparison, at the same time, 9 of 10 of the largest supermarkets pay more than this. This is not to diss stop workers. 
I've been a shop worker. I know it's hard work. But when you've got people being played that low to work in social care, as well as that being a problem for them, it is a problem for the people that they're working with in terms of the quality of social care that they will receive. And what is stripped away and the absolute minimalist agenda that current social care operates within is understanding that that support has an embodied element, that you are there caring for a human being, you're bathing a human being, you're feeding a human being. This all gets stripped away in this outsourcing dynamic that we've seen. So what do we need instead? Um, try and lift it a little for a minute. Um, so the Care Collective who produced the Care Manifesto argued that in society as a whole, within the UK and elsewhere, that we have forgotten how to care. And she, they're not just talking about the state, they're talking about us. So is the solution to get the state back in, to, to get the state to re-engage with social care and with welfare and to reduce the role of private enterprise within that? Or do we need to look outside the state as so embedded in these problematic values that it is not rescuable? And as of today, I'm beginning to think that might be the case. Um, now, some of those theorizing from the margins argue exactly that, that we can't look to the state, that politics, rights, etc., shouldn't be about greater recognition from the state, greater resourcing from the state, that instead we should be looking elsewhere for more radical forms of society and of care. Um, and the Care Manifesto talks about some of these examples where we can look at political activism from those marginalized by the state as being a source of a different form of care, a different form of valuing. We see it in the mutual aid societies of COVID-19 where communities did what the state did not. Um, other few examples there I've given from Basil in Milledieu talking about black migrant women's activism in England and Scotland and showing how they were able to enact a form of ethics of care through the work they did with people who had been excluded from the welfare state. Schlack and Kim talk about radical organizing and cultural production under the banner of disability justice. Jupp hi uh, highlights it in relation to anti-poverty campaigns. So the question is, is the state so embedded with ableism and oppressive practices that we cannot look to the state and there's evidence that that may well be the case. So we've seen just, I'll try and go through this quickly, but it's important. Um, you know, we've seen people with learning disabilities held in secure units for decades because social care has not identified the right care package for them to live in the community. The particular example that is there on the screen, um, if you can see it, is actually from highlighting the practice in Scotland. In Scotland, there's sometimes this kind of like, oh no, we're fine, it's England that's a problem. Mm, maybe not so much. Um, but we've also seen the deaths of people with learning disabilities in health and social care. Um, so the newspaper article there highlights both the death of Connor, Connor Sparrowhawk in NHS care, um, but also highlighted that not only were people with learning disabilities dying in health care, but were not being recorded or investigated after their death. Um, we've also seen it in the deaths of people um, who are waiting for or have been refused welfare benefits. So the example on the screen is the death of Errol Graham, who starved to death um, after the DWP wrongly stopped his benefits. Um, we also saw it during the pandemic um, when um, it was highlighted eventually, again due to the activism of disability groups, that learning disabled people were at higher risk of both getting COVID and dying from COVID, and the biggest single contributing factor, living in a residential setting. Um, so all of these examples, and this one last example, sorry, and this is Canada, but I think is relevant um, because it, it feeds into the debates about assisted dying. So Canada has had assisted dying now for some time, and people are beginning to raise concerns about the way in which the legislation is being used to approve people whose reason for wanting to die is that their social care is so dreadful, that that's the basis of their application. So, and I'm sorry also for using the spectator, but um, the headline is, why is Canada euthanizing the poor? So while it's based on Canada, the concern is if legalized um, assisted dying was brought in here, would that be where we ended up too? So conclusion, um, we're nearly there. Um, so we can learn much from the mutual care, um, the mutual aid societies that happened in the pandemic and are continuing to happen now. But I think what I want to argue is that those practices can inform and should inform state provision, but I don't think the reality is that they can be seen as an alternative. 
I don't want to let the state off the hook quite yet, and maybe there's a pragmatics to this too. And none of this is to dispute the oppressive examples I've just given and the many others that exist across health and social care and welfare. And I'm saying this because you know, there's some counters to we can just look to community activism, we can just look to mutual aid societies to do this. One, we know that the mutual aid societies of COVID-19 began to struggle and have struggled to, to deal with the amount of need that was around them. And as we move into the COVID crisis now, you know, we know the food banks are struggling, we know the voluntary organisations are struggling, and they'll look to the winter and think the pandemic was easy in comparison to what they're looking at now um, and what they're going to have to deal with. We also know that mutual aid societies are not immune to the issues of racism, sexism, ableism, etc., that we're talking about. Um, and then finally, for, for this slide, um, that we, we do need to think about the values that come from those outside the system, outside the state, doing this amazing work um, with very little resource. But I think it's another ask, a problematic ask, to imagine that they can also create that new future. There are other actors who need to come in to this process. Um, so I think that care needs to come back into the provision of welfare benefits and social care in a way that means care, not what we get as current social care. Um, and that we do need to draw on the values of mutual aid societies and voluntary groups. Um, but as we do that, we need to hold on to those values that the disability movement advocated for in terms of rights to make decisions about your own care, having a say in your life, and that those who, are chronic illness, who have chronic illness should also have that right. And that therefore, health and social care and welfare need to be adequately resourced in order to not just value and clap for the social care workers, but to pay them at a level which they can survive. Um, and it is also comes from, finally, a recognition that much of disability and illness is a product of society, is a product of social production, is a product of the way in which the state runs. So I want to say the state has a responsibility to fix that. Having just seen who our Prime Minister is in the UK, I acknowledge that is not going to happen anytime soon. So on that note, thank you. <laughs>